All right, here we are another night where there's nowhere to go, nothing to do, and no one to look up to. All the great podcast themes have been turned into podcast theme parks, and I don't know about you, but... Hello, baby, I've been waiting for a Christian Slater podcast. Welcome back to the Christian Slater Monitor. I am Oswald Ramirez, and I'm here today with special surprise co-host to talk about a movie he picked out, Flood, starring Christian Slater and a cast of trillions, really. How long had it been since you saw this? It had been since the VHS days. So when did the movie come out? Like 97, 98? I think 1998. It was released in the yeah, summer, so I believe, of 1998. No, never mind. January of 1998. <laughs> yeah, they dumped it at the beginning of the year. They saw one look at it and they just go january is fine the, the beginning of the year is just fine this is our second movie in a row written by graham yost he was a powerhouse man he was writing all those uh, 90s action comedy thrillers i think he mainly did the thriller element like and then maybe somebody else would punch these scripts up i'm not sure exactly this one doesn't have as many like wise cracks as some of the others but right I know that they redid speed which was this big breakthrough and then they yeah. redid broken arrow you know i think he gets sole credit maybe on both but and then I, I don't so. know about this one or not and then later he'd go <laughs> on to create the show justified there you go so he's made tons of go. money this guy fun fact uh my girlfriend just got paramount plus and she wanted to go and revisit some of the old nickelodeon shows from our youth whoa graham yost it was his first writing job was writing for hey dude hey dude wow how many characters from hey dude can you name offhand well i'm i'm kind of cheating a little bit because oh, because we have you've been watching episodes it. so you got buddy yeah. Mr. E, Ted, Mr. E, Danny, the Rebel, the Jake, <laughs> yeah. this is, this is Melanie, who later went on to marry Ben Stiller. In, yes, in real yes. Life. And Brad, who went on to absolutely nothing. Right. I think that was her one and only credit was yes. just she, Hey Dude. She just did Hey Dude. Danny didn't yeah. do much either, I don't think. There was an internet thing going around where they thought that he was dead. She, she, then, she, like, she, she, she wrote on like some, I don't know, Reddit thread. It's like, no, he's my neighbor. He's a good friend of mine. He's fine. He just doesn't want to act. That's cool. Yeah. With Chris Christian Slater here. You've got Morgan Freeman, Randy Quaid, Minnie Driver, Edward Asner, Michael A. Georgian as the character of Kenny, <laughs> Dan Florick as Mr. Mailer. Ricky Harris as Ray, which I only know Ricky Harris for one thing more or less as the guy that Al Pacino asks if he if he uh, met a great ass and had his head all the way up it in heat. Tone Loke's cousin. <laughs> cousin of Loke. And then you got Wayne Duvall as Hank, the damn guy. Richard Dicehart and Betty White as a married couple that won't leave. Yeah. Mostly Betty White. Peter Murnick as Phil, the nice cop. And here we have Mark nice Ralston guy. as Wayne, who <laughs> is... In one of his many, many, many roles, probably all of his roles as a would-be rapist. Right. <laughs> Except for in, like, The Departed. This is only where he wasn't playing the rapist. Like, he was kind of the rapist in Aliens, right? And right, right. Of course, Boggs in Shawshank Redemption is his most legendary role, perhaps. How many, how many Academy Award nominees are in this film? That's a good question. I don't think they ever nominated Minnie Driver for an award that I can recall. I think she got one. I think she got a nomination for Good Will Hunting, I think. Really? Whoa. You're right. There's an Academy Award winning or nominee right here, and it was for Good Will Hunting. You called that. I did not yeah. know. So, of course, Christian Slater never nominated for an Academy Award. A crime. A, a crime. crime. A crime, indeed. Morgan Freeman, winner. Winner, yeah. And, and multiple nominee, too. And I think Randy Quaid's a nominee, too, for something he did in the 70s. One Oscar nominee for, you were correct, for The Last Detail for Best Supporting Actor. Nice. How do you like yeah, The I Last? I've never seen. You've never yeah. seen The Last Detail? You should watch that. Never seen The Last You're going to love I've it. never seen it. One of the classics. Is Ed Asner a nominee by chance? Probably not for JFK. <laughs> Another crime. No, Another no. Crime. No Oscar nominees that I could see here so far. He won seven primetime Emmys. More of a TV guy than, yeah. Gotcha. I don't think Kenny was ever nominated. We might only have those three. So we have uh, two two titans coming together. We have the, the, the cinematic accomplishments and then, and then the television accomplishments, too, coming together for hard range. And many of them probably for the same program because I don't know what Richard Dysart won an Emmy for. I don't remember him from TV. I remember him more from movies, a lot of roles right. like this. The bad guy in Just Pale Rider. He's like, he's always that guy. Yes, like he, he is a classic, yes. Like, yeah, it's like, that's that guy. 
Yes, very much of that guy. He and Mark Ralston, I think, are kind of very much kind of that guy actors. There he is again. So yeah. I guess we'll just get right into the movie Flood. Begin spoilers. I remember seeing a movie poster at the Spotlight 14, I believe, in Norman for the movie Flood. Way before yes. they retitled it. It was maybe a year before the movie came out. And yeah. they at some point retitled it Hard Rain. I looked online. I could not find a single promotional material photograph online of the Flood merchandising or, or, or posters. So if you own a Flood poster, boy, you've got a rare item. <laughs> it may be worth upwards of 5 to $6. <laughs> yes. So the movie starts with the Paramount logo and that drifts down from being a mountain into being the Huntingburg flooding evacuation in progress. So we get this crazy process shot of CG or something with the Paramount going down into the storm and rain and cloudy skies, murky cloudy skies. As we push in through all this, we get one piece of awesome product placement for McDonald's. And yes. we also get our first harmonica. We get, we get the Morricone kind of feel for this movie they're going for. And that's when we meet Randy Quaid and he's talking to the damn guy Hank and he's hanging out with his partner cops. Randy Quaid is the sheriff. Do you remember Randy Quaid's name? Sheriff Shit, baby. Sheriff, sheriff something. Just, his name is just Sheriff according to the credits. And we meet his partners Mark Ralston and the other cop Peter Murnick as Phil. Then we find out that the mayor cruises by and they're on one of their last days of the job because the mayor helped the sheriff lose the election. We don't ever find out why that's one of the big mysteries of Hard Rain. It is. It's one of those, it's one of those shady kind of plot holes that, that the Coen brothers like to do. They just don't even, they don't tell you the gaps. Now, that's true. Do you think that Randy Quaid didn't play ball with the mayor? Was the mayor the jerk? Or is Randy Quaid the jerk? Or are they both the jerks? What's the answer here? It's one of those unanswerable questions. One of the great mysteries in, in uh, cinematic history. When they say the mayor screwed Quaid, we don't know. Mayor. Mayor was playing dirty. I was going to say, this is a mechanical. Solomon film. Did we, uh, oh, no, we, we didn't. No, we didn't cover Mikhail Solomon. He was the yeah. cinematographer of such films as The Abyss, and he was recommended by James Cameron to shoot to direct this. <laughs> this was, I think, his, first, his directorial <laughs> debut. He's worked with water once. <laughs> Let him helm a movie. Yeah, he was a, cinema a big cinematographer, and this movie does yeah. look really good, I feel like. And the moment we're coming up on where we first meet Ed Asner and Christian Slater as an uncle and nephew uh, armored truck drivers and they're getting a big shipment of money and a guy tells him, hold on a second and he's like you forgot to sign this form and I was thinking that was more tension and suspense than we're in, in the entirety of Broken Arrow right right but it looks like he pretty much went from this to TV almost uh, no, you'll see yeah, one more movie A Far Off Place the title sounds familiar oh yeah it was one of those live action Disney films oh. mid 90s but see, he was the cinematographer of Far and Away Backdraft Arachnophobia, Always, the Forgotten Spielberg movie. Even the Spielberg heads ignore Always. No one really brings that one up. No. I remember I saw like the last five minutes on TV once and that was enough to tell me I never need to see this movie. Was it Dreyfus in Always? I don't think I've ever seen it before. Just because I've never heard a single good word ever spoken about it. He and Deborah Winger and maybe John Goodman? Was it Deborah Winger or Holly Hunter? It's one of the two. At any rate, they load the armored car and then... Uh, then we go to the gang. We meet the, the gang of would-be robbers in the in a bar. And Kenny is bragging about all the money they're going to get. I mean, Morgan Freeman is the leader, and he's working a crossword puzzle. And he sends it over to Kenny and asks him if he's got it right. And it says, if you say one more word about the money, I'll kill you or something like that. He's like, you got it right. I always, I always love uh, see, uh, scenes in movies when it's just the introduction, and then they just speak in exposition for <laughs> five or six minutes. They're, like, they're just telling us what they're going to do. I already, though, feel like this gang and Morgan Freeman are more believable and more memorable than the... See, I, I'll filter all this through a man who's just seen the movie Broken Arrow. And, <laughs> and, and these guys are just so much more, like, believable and everything. Morgan Freeman's so much better as the villain in this. Right. Is, is he the villain than, uh, than Travolta was? And, yeah, these guys are so much more fun than Howie Long and Bob Gunton. So they're going to, I guess, rob the uh, something, the armor car and yeah. Wayne opens a floodgate and the armored car floods out and strands Asner and Christian Slater. Asner calls the National Guard to come out and help them and he says it's going to be two hours. Then we meet Miss Henry and Mrs. Henry, Dicehart and Betty White. They won't leave their home.
wrong because they fear looters like in 1973. <laughs> well, it's happened before to them, and it may happen again to them. You never know. Well, someone does break into their home later. I caught. Spoiler. Spoiler alert. <laughs> You're right. So then we get the heist. Right after yeah. this, we're already to where Asner again Slater get accosted by these guys, the gang, and the gang flashes floodlights on him from afar, tells him to get out of the car. Slater immediately points out that they're blind by floodlights and that they can't see anything. At this point, we kind of get the, we start getting these weird shots of Ed Asner looking around, shifty, shifty eyed and stuff. <laughs> Did you think they were tipping the hand a little hard on this? Right, right. That's funny. Did you think it would be better what or down? not better if, if we, you didn't think, uh, if you didn't know Asner was in on it? Do you think there was a way to really keep that from you longer and have you not guess it? Not at all. Not at all. Uh, one thing I noticed in this part is when they're hanging out in the car and stuff, the back and forth between he and Ed Asner, where, Ed, where he's like, says if he keeps eating those uh, lunches or something, he'll never get out of this, uh, out of this truck. And Ed Asner's like, oh, you just think you're above all this. That's pretty much the setup for almost the, the traditional Christian Slater role of every role is where he's the guy who thinks he knows better than the adults and he has right. some kind of and here we find out he also has potential because he shows good sense in the robbery we find out he's not dumb exactly this, exactly this yeah, is a good he's thing a thinker this was a good screenwriting subtle thing like when he says they, they're they blinding us we find out he's not crappy at the job even though he holds it in contempt they fire off and they shoot at oh Kenny shoots at Asner and shoots him to death and Slater all the way they kill him till he dies from it <laughs> <laughs> they slide, and the Slater runs, a, swims away with the money, and he hides it in Natalie Portman's crypt in this <laughs> flooded uh, graveyard, which leads the gang to break into a water sports store. Not the kind you're As thinking one of. Does. This is cool. You know, this was right. the also it in. Is, it is shot really well. In what's uh, you know, just in Commando and movies like this, where somebody gets a toy run. I guess they don't really. We don't see them get to go on the toy run here, but we get to see them with the fruits of the toy run of the water sports store because yeah. they steal a boat and te two sea doos or jet skis. Are you sure? Do you know if these are jet skis or sea doos? I think it's one of those things. It's like a tomato tomato type okay. of deal. I think that I think I think I think I think they're all jet skis, but a sea doo is a certain brand. Okay, okay. Then this was but awesome. Also, the idea that a town is flooded and you get to roam around it in a boat, and they say that the boat, the water is shallow, and that uh, they need a boat with a shallow hole. When they when they when they start out in this boat, the water is really shallow. I would be afraid of these boats and these sea dew in this water but I mean I'm no expert this is like a part where like the water is about like 2.5 feet deep it's like not even to Slater's waist and they're going around in a boat I feel pretty iffy about that and I think at one point have we gotten to the part where they're just cruising through the uh, through the high school or the no high this is we, well yes we're there now they chase them okay. into the middle school which is my favorite part of the movie oh when they do the Paramount thing at the beginning that pans right down into this, this stuff do you miss movies not having 50 production logos before they start yeah exactly exactly yeah it's like paramount paid the movie and distributed the film and this is the logo this is the one only logo that you're gonna see yes paramount this the studio that made the godfather <laughs> and hard rain we made <laughs> also the christian slater co-producer in this movie did you see that yeah yeah, yeah, he dipped a toe into uh, some uh, behind the scenes. He really wanted to make this movie. Like, he really, really wanted to make this movie. So he started it and then co-produced it, whatever that means. I mean, this is an interesting thing because if you're an actor signing yourself into a, like, pushing forward a movie with this much water in it, doesn't that just seem like setting yourself up for a miserable experience? You know, I thought about that. I, the first time I saw it, you know, when I was a boy, it didn't really click, but rewatching it a week or two ago, and I was like, this looks fucking miserable. Yes. This looks absolutely Absolutely horrible. Why would you volunteer to sign up for this shit? I always think that anytime there's a movie with water, either the people thought it was an amazing script or they really needed the money. But this right, seems like right. the thing about this movie is that it is a neo western kind of movie, and actors, I think that especially guy actors and stuff, one of the big reasons you go into making movies is to make gangster and western movies. And so maybe Watch this is stuff. yeah, so maybe this is a movie that Slater really wanted to make. And plus, it's an action movie that he could get. Going 
going to the theaters with a strong enough supporting cast to make up for the fact that a lot of other Slater-led films did not do well. Did this come out before or after Broken Arrow? After. After, okay. Yeah, sort of a double Graham Yost Slater magic. <laughs> They're throwing heat. The one-two punch, the Yost and Slater. <laughs> yes. In they, they, unwatchable action movies. Yeah, so they blow the doors off this high, middle school and they ride in and we get our set and when Slater's running away from this place and this is just my favorite this is like a dream come true I saw this I guess in the middle of senior year of high school or no in the middle of junior year with my brother at the theater and yeah just the guys riding around on sea dues in a high school it's like that was just kind of a, a dream you never knew you had come to life 100% and they seem to be wave runners or sea dues are really hard to operate but they seem to be operating them with total ease on oh these guys right oh, I've turns. never been on one I'd love to it's so. very hard to turn at a right angle like they do <laughs> gracefully in hard grade in the junior high or high school or wherever the hell it is that they are. This movie's all it looks pretty well funded throughout with like tons of coverage and stuff. And I wonder if it wasn't due to some of the wonderful product placement we had there and in the middle school where they have the Pepsi machine. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's why they're still able to keep, you know, keep keep all the rain machines. Did, did I read that they filmed it, like, they had to find a studio big enough or a building big enough to film it in, so they converted, like, an old, like, airplane hangar. Oh, wow. I did not read that. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Because I was wondering, like, even while I was watching, I was like, what how the hell they did it? Because it has a lot of location changes for being a small town. Sure. They have a lot of It really does. Changes, but, yeah. That high school is pretty high schooly. Right? It's pretty right. good. He disposes of Kenny temporarily, then he puts on uh, Kenny's hat as a disguise but it doesn't fool the guy from Heat. <laughs> like, for even a moment, really. And then Freeman finds uh, the discarded tie of Slater and knows Slater is alive. And Freeman asks for Bible verses from Heat guy. And this was... How'd you, you do. how'd you feel about the quoting of the Bible verses by the guy? That's just one of those, like, silly movie tropes. Like, no one ever does that in real life. Exactly. Like, like, movie mm-hmm. things that just happens. People just kind of just nod and go along, but then like, don't notice it. I don't know, like, in a, David Mamet doesn't quote the Bible, but he has those little colloquialisms mm-hmm. from time to time. And, like, you don't notice it in there, but, like, like when they stick out, like, a sore thumb, you just, like, go, could someone have taken a second pass at this screenplay? Just at some of the dialogue, please. We continue to see this as a trope even today, like, of the, the henchman or the villain or the villain himself quoting the Bible and to be very scary. <laughs> and right. I was thinking old movies, probably somebody helpful would quote the Bible, but nowadays, if someone quotes the Bible, it's always... <laughs> Always somewhat evil. <laughs> Which leads one hundred percent correct. Slater goes and hides out for sanctuary in church, where he gets cold cocked by an unseen person, and mm-hmm. he wakes up. Hello, Dad. He is in jail, and many driver is there, and she cold cocked him, and sheriff and his gang is there. She thinks that he was Chris Slater was a looter. She is caught, and she's been restoring the church. Yeah. She's moved back to the up to the town she grew up in to restore the church. And she's got a sick house there. We see later. A good looking crib, yeah. And the gang's looking around for the money. There's so many good actors in this movie when he's there, explaining there really are I wish they had more stuff to work with was what I was thinking when they were hanging out in this prison scene I was like Minnie Driver is pretty enjoyable I think and she and Slater have good chemistry and mm-hmm. Randy Quaid I always like and I like Mark Ralston too Randy then, Quaid's just you can actually see him in certain scenes just sneaking off to go cash his paycheck <laughs> same with Morgan Freeman too they're like they, they like the last line and they just kind of dip out of the scene so they I, can go cash it before it bounces. I thought they were both really good in the movie and I thought that uh, what's his face Randy Quaid was probably yeah like he's always probably on the lookout any role that doesn't require him to be an incredible goof ass. Right. He was like oh I get to be the sheriff and be uh, Mysterio. That's not so bad. I gotta hang out in flood waters all the time. Please pay me double. <laughs> so Slater tells the cops the whole deal and they go to look for the money and they leave Slater tied up in jail and Driver wants to fill the pumps to save the window but she's ordered to go with Phil, the cop Phil, who's going to take her out of town, but she keeps pleading with him about these windows she's worked so hard to save, and eventually she just jumps out of the car. She pushes him out of the boat and takes his boat to go do her job. She really likes those windows at the church. Yes. She worked a long time on them. Yeah, if you work so hard on them and knew what they're worth or something or how long something's been there, sometimes that kind of stuff like can start to blur like human life versus something that's been somewhere for like longer than a human life.
human life. I don't know how long any windows in America have been around. And I like it because she's because she, she's another one who's like this is if this is ninety eight. This is just fresh off the Goodwill Hunting buzz. Yes. So she's trying to uh, you know pad the resume with as much as she can. That's right. She, and get an action movie going. You know, like that's I was thinking about this and Broken Arrow really did work for Christian Slater because even today he can be a direct to video western star and stuff. He, right. he did sell right. Man of Action even if this movie didn't sell a lot of tickets. You know, in the whatever it was the eighties throughout the nineties before all this before all the Marvel shit became the norm. Like that's what you did. Like you got got your award or you got some acclaim or some buzz mm-hmm. and then you just went and made an action. Yes. And like that's what you did. That's how you ensured being staying at the theater of being a leading man was get some kind of action movie going. Yeah. Now it's and all super that, and now he just does those like direct to streaming submarine movies that no one ever <laughs> has ever seen. He does so many direct to video movies. It's crazy. People think people talk about how he used to be good and now he's like a joke but I almost feel like he shoots the same percentage of movies good to bad as he always did he just makes 12 a year now so it's like the classic 1 in 10 movies being good he's just now there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of movies 100% 100% yeah so like still yeah. 1 in 10 of them is good we're 1 in 12 yeah, yeah yeah he's still batting the same percentage it's just we don't see the other ones I watched one of his the other night Zondali from the other ni- early 90s have you ever heard of this <laughs> Is it a Slater or a Nick Cage? It's a Nick Cage, and it's very much the okay. same kind of thing he could get going now. Like, it's like he <laughs> it's he and Judge Reinhold in an erotic thriller love triangle movie taking place in the South, <laughs> and it is really it bad. So bad. It's, it's, it so bad. It's, it's so bad it's good. It's really good. It's really worth a watch. Zondali, that's the girl's name in the movie. Zondali. The lady's name. So Wayne is taking a dump when the flood reaches into his bathroom, and so he realizes he, he rushes down, pants down from the bathroom and opens another floodgate. And the town gets a rush of water, which upsets all the boaters. And Karen uh, was filling the pumps when the waters hit her. Phil grabs onto a gargoyle for survival. This town has so much stuff. Do we ever... Here's a question. Do what state does the movie take place in? See, I was thinking like the like the upper Midwest, like uh, Ohio or... Hmm. All the Crip Iowa. stuff kept making me remember it as New Orleans, but it's clearly not New Orleans. It's called Huntingsburg or something but I'm not sure where it was. Maybe it is Ohio or something. They refer to the Johnstown flood a couple of times. Yeah. But all of those, like, all the gargoyles and the crypts and stuff all have a very French, Gothic kind of feel. I don't know where you get all that stuff other than the South, but I'm sure you can. I mean, there's a Victorian you know, house name. 36 on Metacritic right now. 36 for Hard Rain? 36 on Meta. In uh, Slater, he fell asleep in jail, and he wakes up with the water right under his mattress level. Like, if he would have woken up second later he'd be wet but it's risen up right to where he is it didn't soak his mattress under him then he lassos the keys with a gun belt and yeah. to, the, to the cell as it's filling up and then it doesn't work because they turn out to be car keys <laughs> It's like, great, now I can drive. The water keeps fl- filling up and up. This is a big suspense scene. I don't know how much suspense we were in since Christian Slater is the star of the movie. This might and have we been... were in, what, 20 minutes into the film still? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Not much real peril, Hill. Mostly a waste of time. But it's very well shot if you did feel something for... The, if you did think the character was in some kind of peril, it might have been something. Many driver shows up and rescues him by very expertly, and I was afraid they were going to draw the scene out with her dropping the screwdriver into the thing and him having to get it but they didn't she very expertly unscrews a ceiling window on the jail cell as all jail cells have yes is this one of our first things where we get a a wet gun working really well it's like it's like still shooting accurately yeah they've got he's got the holster in his ankle or something is this where we see that maybe not oh no that's later i suppose that but whatever at some point we get a nice ankle holster in a in flood waters that makes a gun work very well so they get out of there and then the kid the Wayne not Wayne the kid Kenny he chases him around on jet skis and he fi- or on a jet ski and he fires the pistol in the air and they hide and then uh, Mini Driver and Slater they're pretty good together they have a, like a moment in the car where they they get to know one each one another did you like their interplay in the car he was just very generic and very canned 
like just the typical mid to late 90s chit chit chat oh where, yeah where you know that they'll eventually make out or kiss before the movie's over and they had uh, one thing when Slater was in jail they had him start to have some kind of attraction with when he would wisecrack the cops and they would show many driver kind of laugh to herself right. starting right. to realize like, oh he's oh he's cute there's oh. yes there's something yes. to this guy <laughs> Boggs taunts Phil about losing Karen. Now the now the flood is getting really high, and it's getting up to, to a power line level, and then they realize they're in big trouble because they are holding onto a metal ladder. Yeah. And so this is where we get where they swing to these windows and stuff, and then all of a sudden Kenny shows up trying to, and he's in the water, and they try to tell him to get out of the water. The power line goes. Yeah. Kenny gets fried holding onto a ladder. Poor Kenny. Our favorite character. And Mr. We miss one, one member of the game, Mr. Mellowers, was a, was a public school teacher that was uh, kind of a proto uh, Walter White 1.0 with the glasses and everything. But that scene does express a little bit of humanity from Christian Slater because he tries to extend the hand to the thief. They try to, to save him. him. Yeah, they tell yeah. him, they give him the advice to, to let go of the metal, too. They really do yeah. give him every chance, but he is one dumb, dumb guy, this kitty. <laughs> And what they do is they break into a house now and immediately almost um, fall into bear traps that have been yes. set up for looters. Which Betty are, White and her, and her dear and her beloved husband once, thought that they were crazy. Once yeah. they set off the first one, they get in fine, though. It's indeed the AR, then uh, held up by a shotgun by Betty White and Richard Dysart, who never left town and are now rewarded with catching some delicious looters. I liked them in this movie. They they were They're kind of a trope characters out of Westerns, too, like the hen-pecked hotelier or whatever in, in a Sergio Leone movie and his wife or something. Right. Been Once, there forever. Seen it all a thousand times. They're two fun actors, though. This would be done different. Their roles would be done differently because Betty White is wrong about everything. Right. And Richard Dysart always officially tells her to shut up or like he's going to shoot her <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> All the female characters mistrust Slater initially. Let's see, he's mm -hmm. he's that R-rated guy that you don't know where he's coming from. Yeah, yeah, he's a little dangerous. Okay, so bad guys roll up on Tom, who is that's that's Christian Slater's name, Tom. Okay, so Slater gets they give Christian Slater their boat. The Mr. and Mrs. Henry agree to give Slater their boat to go uh, try to solve things, I guess. And <laughs> then, well, he's out in the boat. Mr. and Mrs. Henry get caught by the bad guys off screen yeah. I suppose but they don't get many driver and then Christian Slater decides to trade them the knowledge of where the money is in exchange for turning Mr. and Mrs. Henry loose and Mr. Henry tells him that what's her face got away Karen mini driver now then they take Tom to the cemetery find that cash and that's when they let him know that Ed Asner was in on it which duh and they tell them right. but we also we did not know that he never called the National Guard this is a weird movie where we he tells us now that we've been operating under some kind of clock with the two hours we knew earlier that we had two hours till the Coast Guard shows up but we never really feel like there's a clock on this movie do we like uh, you know, I never got that feeling this I think that was supposed to be part of like the the bus never goes below 50 is like you've got this two hours you only got to survive two hours then you find out it's not two hours but it's like we forgot about the Coast Guard pretty much immediately <laughs> After they, <laughs> after they were called. If you put uh, a time, give someone a deadline, it only works if there's stakes. Like, it works in speed because it's pretty easy to understand. Yes. The bus drops below a certain mile per hour, the bus explodes with everybody inside. Like, those are, like, those are stakes and realistic stakes because obviously the bus is driving on the highway, you know, trying to not, not uh, tip below. Was, was it 50 or 60 miles an hour? I feel like I should know. This. It was 50. Yeah. I watched speed after watching this to see, and speed was one I had not seen since the 90s. It holds up, man. I watched it about a month ago. See, I think Speed is the ultimate one-timer movie. <laughs> With I didn't I saw it once and loved it and then have never really enjoyed it again and watching it yeah. now after maybe 23 years or 20, 20 close to 25 years like within a few minutes I was bored stiff and remembered everything that would happen in the movie but that said right. you're right it totally the first time you see it it totally works and part of the reason is Hopper's so crazy in that opening scene you really think he might kill those people oh, in, the, in the elevator and then in the yes. bus he does kill some of the people off yeah. and they, they get yeah. real stakes going it's not always about are they going to kill Keanu and Sandra Bullock. It's about all these other little people that you sure he might kill. 
100%. Jeff Daniels 100%. and whatnot. Yeah, it really works. And then they have the they have the great gimmick of this of this bus with the fifty. This movie they have the great gimmick of running around a town in a flood, and that that gives it more than Broken Arrow. I have to say, which has no gimmick at all. That's no what I was thinking. Gimmick, this is no, a lot no, like, like Broken yeah. Arrow. Both movies seem to have an obsession with taking uh, things from Sam Peckinpah movies, like especially Ride the High Country and The Wild Bunch, and mm-hmm. then taking all the poetry out and just make it a, a just a blind action movie of people in different spheres coming together right. and being thrown into action sequences right. out in the middle of nowhere somewhere. So Tom goes underneath the water for the cash. The guy from Heat, he is the uh, he's asked called upon to give them more scripture, but instead <laughs> reads from The River by Bruce Springsteen. Oh, the boss. The he boss. Just the river. <laughs> the boss. Which is another. Um, oh wait, never mind. That was in Broken Arrow, where Christian Slater says he learned something in New Jersey. I thought that might have been a link. Where many other characters come from New Jersey and Graham Yost westerns. <laughs> from the Graham Yost cinematic universe. <laughs> yes. And right as he's done reading this, the cops show up. The cavalry arrives in the form of the police, and they blow a Heat guy and Mr. Mailers away like yeah, immediately. They have like machine guns, if I recall. Maybe they've got. Uh, crazy into lots of shotguns in this movie. Their backup guy shows up, Hank, the or Wayne, never mind, right? Is it Hank or Wayne? It's Hank, who's those, the, like, the dam break names. guy. Yeah. Yes, the dam break. We get a lot of those like here, like the the uh, Wade, uh, Hank, Mr. Mailers, Kenny, Mr. Mailers. all movie yeah. kind of names, right? It's the names like that and the abundance of shotguns makes it has to be in the uh, in the Rust Belt. It has to take place in the Rust Belt with those with, with both those two ideas. Yeah, and you never have any crazy colorful names. It's Mr. and Mrs. Henry, right, and stuff like that. Right, right. Just some real good old-fashioned folks. Mer- Morgan Freeman holds Slater at gunpoint, and this is when we find out, like, as a human shield to protect himself from Randy Quaid, and this is when we find out that Randy Quaid, big shocker, is actually in it for the money, mm-hmm. and he takes a sh- he goes ahead and takes a shot at Christian Slater, pretty much dividing the lines pretty clearly, and <laughs> saying he tells everybody they're going to split the money four ways and the two million dollars or something or no it's maybe something. more maybe it's two and a half or something no maybe it's three because they're going I to get, each three. get seven hundred fifty thousand, right which yeah. four times yeah. four let's see and so apparently hank is a great hunter and he's going to help them hunt for this money and he does seem to do a pretty good job like sniffing he's first on the case like when they find slater each time and yeah. he's he's got the explosives they use that help him out here in a minute but Phil is Phil is uneasy about this. He has a crush on Minnie Driver, and he also sure. is, has a heart and kind of a kinder face than certainly than Boggs and Randy Quaid. And so this Slater and Freeman kind of band together in self-defense here, and they become kind of a team. And Quaid throws away his badge, and Phil draws down on Quaid, saying he can't let him be all evil. And then Quaid's like, two things are going to happen. You're going to put down that gun, or you're going to put me down with that gun. And it's like one of the <laughs> one of two things going to happen. That's when... Uh, uh, that's when the explosive goes off that Hank is set and helps right. uh, upsets the boat. So that frees Quaid and Freeman grabs the bo- uh, grabs a boat and rescues Christian Slater and they make a hasty getaway until finally the hull of a boat scrapes on something and it's this Uh-oh. certainly a, a statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest or some other Confederate hero. <laughs> Jedediah Springfield. <laughs> like the tip of his sword, it stripes like on the tip of his sword. Yes. Saber, yeah, that was, I thought that was some stupid fun. This movie does yeah. get, like, script for this movie sucks, but, uh, like, a lot of their little action beats and stuff are pretty fun, I think. Like, the, the, uh, what, the, the running around in the high school, the running around looking for the grave in the tomb, just running around in the flooded crypt, like, is pretty cool looking yeah. consistently and pretty fun. And then, yeah. uh, there was the third thing, this, right, oh, you know, when they go in the church later, is pretty fun, I think. It's a it's a really beautifully uh, lit scene yeah. uh, with all that stained glass and and, there, and there's some decent tension. Yes. In that scene too. Yeah, and because yeah. they do have enough cross characters, and you have kind of made fun friends with some of the bad guys in some way. Randy Quaid and and Boggs and Morgan Freeman to some extent, but a better better characters and better dialogue throughout would have just really cert- made this movie a way better, obviously. Because I I still kind of enjoy the movie, but I can understand anyone who hates this movie. Everything in it is perfunctory, you know. You know. Oh God, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's 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 just you know, speed's made up of all of the good parts. 
parts of that, uh, like an action film. Yes. It's made up of all the kind of the bad parts. Yeah, like, like, like between the, the between action, it's all pretty bad, and it's yeah, kind of it's yeah. it takes place in the movie universe, and it's all kind of refers to other movies in a way, except I, I was, the, I was the invention the, of the, the high school. When, the scene when Randy Quaid has the badge and throws it. <laughs> I was the sheriff. That's one of those stupid again. That, that's one of those stupid movie things that only happens in movies. But I really just kind of dug it in that in that particular spot. Yeah, Randy Quaid is it's pretty just, delicious in this part. <laughs> it's, like, it's this kind just of chewing his scenery. Yes, yeah. yes. He's just chewing it up. Now, what do you think about that? So, in Speed, Yost, you know, writes the script, and then they give it to Joss Whedon to punch up. Yeah. Uh, punch up the dialogue and maybe kind of tighten some of it. But he's never given credit for it. Like, you just have to, like, like he gets all that the money. shit always comes out. Usually. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He gets the money, but not the credit. I think that's a good way to make these movies. One of my favorite action films of all time is The Rock. And and I was doing some reading on it about a year or so ago, and I was like, well, no wonder I like it, because I, I, I don't recall who who's credited for the screenplay. But they had both Aaron Sorkin and Quentin Tarantino punch up the dialogue Whoa. in it. And I was like, well, no wonder. That's one of the few movies I think that like I can rewatch. Our normal co-host, Rayno Carson, she chose to watch the movie Broken Arrow because she thought it might be like The Rock. She loved as well. I don't think she much cared for Broken Arrow. <laughs> But I didn't know what to tell her because I never liked The Rock. I don't like The Rock. Interesting. Mm. Interesting. As far as like those action, those action comedy, oh, I, I, I prefer Hard oh, Rain. You prefer it. Oh, oh, Yeah, something, I saw The Rock at, what, a drive-in movie theater as a teenager with my family. I didn't like it then and it had gotten good reviews and everybody liked it. And I saw it and I was like, I don't get what I'm missing here. And then I saw it again years and years and years later one more time and still didn't get what I was missing. I was like, I don't get Interesting. it. Interesting. Interesting. I, uh, on this second shelf back here, you will find find uh, the Criterion version of The Rock that I got. Nice. Santa Claus brought it to me one year. Ed Harris's finest. William Forsythe just oh. yelling the entire time. <laughs> wow, I forgot William Forsythe was even in that. Yeah. That was before yeah. he he went to go show scenery on every television show there was. Exactly. He's exactly. Just the, playing goons. The human shark jet. So after this, though, they go in the church once again to find shelter, I guess, and the bad cops bust in on them with one of my favorite shots of the movie where the crazy stand glass face comes off the window. They bust through. When he, they were destroy many drivers' windows. They also try to burn them out. Yeah. In the yeah. Fi- in the fire. So they're setting the church on fire. And but mysteriously, Phil is back with them in the fold somehow. Right? Like he's just suddenly. It's like all he and Randy Quaid's tension seems to be totally forgotten. I think that they had a little off-screen talk to him mm-hmm. and uh, maybe kind of showed him some of the money. Showed him maybe like a, a nice house he could buy with the money. And he was like, okay, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. He seemed really incorrect. A guy that'll pull a gun on you to save the money. One of the other big lines, Randy Quaid, is like, well, what about Tom and Karen? They're not looters. And he says, no, they're witnesses. It's like, if you're murdering people for money, that was do you, have you seen Uncut Gems? Yeah. One of the most just shut up, buddy, and of course he kills him right there moments. Spoilers when Eric Bogosian gets killed in Uncut Gems. And I yeah, liked it because, yeah. because immediately, because that thug guy immediately once he's killing people, it's like, you just act like you're not going to be with him till the day you die. You're getting killed right there. And it's like, Instantly, yes. it, it's like you can't trust a guy in court later that's not with you now. And it's like, right. yeah, it's like if I'm Randy Quaid and I'm the sheriff, as soon as I'm black, I, I got to kill Phil there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, I'll get to it in 10 minutes. Mm-mm. It's like, no, as soon as you, if, if as I'm soon as car, you have time, yeah, you got to figure out a way to kill Phil. You got to get him out of there. He's a loose cannon. That's right. He's going to rat on you later. Yeah. Yeah. You can tell just by looking at him. So they, they then, uh, so should they, they come in with Phil and let's see here. So they, then they get into another standoff. Christian Slater pulls a gun on Phil, and Phil and he kind of look at each other. Then Christian Slater realizes Phil's a guppy, not a shark, and he turns the he, he in a great moment of sense turns his gun instead on Hank. Yeah. And then Hank turns the gun on them, and in a poorly edited or shot little thing, Christian Slater ducks down under the water, and Hank blows Phil away <laughs> and calls him a wuss. <laughs> calls him a wuss. <laughs> Phil gets killed here, and Doe, oh, at some point we find out, too, that um, Kenny was being looked after by Morgan Freeman and wasn't even really supposed to be in the gang or something. He's looking after him for his old man or something. And that's right out of what happened to Bo Hopkins in the Wild Bunch. That's a direct Wild Bunch reference. Somehow here, Tom gets the drop on Randy Quaid for a moment and gets the whereabouts of Karen, who is busy, kind of uh, about to be raped by Bob. 
Boggs right. Boggs takes Karen to her house, claiming they need to spread He's... around the bodies of these people they're killing. Such a weird sentence. But I think she's still alive at the time where the, Phil knows it because he's like, Don't you do it! Don't you do it! No, we gotta go spread them around. <laughs> then Boggs goes into full Boggs mode, talking about how she left the town she thought she was too good for him. It's like, Dear Penthouse, <laughs> I never thought these letters were true. What kind of Penthouse letter would start? I don't know what they're publishing there, but like, I told my boss that we needed to spread the bodies around. And I couldn't believe my luck, but I had a live wo woman. I took her to her home and handcuffed her to her staircase and, and then taunted her about thinking she was too good for my town. <laughs> <laughs> tell you, I always thought these stories were fake. Oh, man. Yeah, the... Uh, Wait, this is yeah. also uh, another uh, movie where uh, Morgan Freeman and Boggs are in it together. Um, yeah, because they were in Shawshank, that's right? That's right, that's right. Yeah. Karen f fights off the sisters. They're just not very good bad guys. Like, they're just not good at being bad guys. Yeah, and they're, they're not they're, overly like, they're memorable. I thought Morgan Freeman was really good, and Boggs, all the, the acting was good, but the part's just not written. And they're, yeah, they're not that good at doing anything. Seems like he should have easily gotten Karen, but I guess the damn Bro. Pink's not there Damn to it. watch it. He's busy stealing money. Yeah. And we get the big thing at the end where somehow Karen rolls up on him. They find Richard Dicehart. Betty White's with Richard Dicehart, who who I guess was almost died, but Dicehart dies hard, and he lives. <laughs> Can't knock a good Dicehart down. Oh, yeah. Did Randy Quaid and the bad guys roll up on Tom and Karen in the in Karen's house to finally get the money. Again, again the new bad guys, which are the cops. And, sure, sure. We have now switched. And they are they just down to Randy Quaid at this point? Did they get rid of Hank and Boggs? Yeah, I think both. Yeah, both of his like little lieutenants got, got shot up in the church. Yeah. No, she yeah. stabs Boggs in the neck when he's trying to rape her. Is that what happened? Yeah, she gets him in the neck with like a pocket knife or her Swiss right. Army knife That's or something. Right. And he dies instantly. He gets up and he's like, oh, yes, <laughs> yes. And he's got a gun and it's and then he dies. So I guess they we're just down to them. And then Morgan Freeman rolls up as the cavalry that. Uh, this time and saves them. He comes at him in a boat and the boat goes over like the bus in speed on the ramp. The boat ramps mm -hmm. off Karen's roof. It like <laughs> uses it as a ramp. Morgan Freeman bails <laughs> first. To find it right now. Yeah, the, the motor, the outboard motor of the boat breaks no off idea. and flies yeah. off into the air and hits Randy Quaid in the face. <laughs> It's one of those such this stupid movie thing is when the villain just dies with weight, like a flying outboard motor from a boat. <laughs> it was just used to jump the roof of a house. And, and Morgan Freeman is bailed from the wa from the uh, boat, so he's safe. But so I guess like there's one bag of money that, or no, they're on the this other boat with bags of money or something now. And Karen is by the money, and Randy Quaid is not dead. He comes out of the water, and she pulls a gun on him, and she's got him mm -hmm. dead to rights, and he's just looking at her. Then he eventually pulls up a gun, so it's okay to shoot him now. And movie movie words it's now okay to shoot Randy Quaid and <laughs> she still loss. can't do it she's like hesitates forever then finally Tom shoots him from off screen Morgan Freeman tells him he didn't come back to save them he came for the money the state police show up the stadies show up out of nowhere stadies and they're far enough away I guess that they can't see them very well because Christian Slater tells Morgan Freeman to go get out of there and Morgan oh. Freeman grabs the bag of money that Randy Quaid's corpse was hanging on to so he gets one <laughs> bag of money and rides out <laughs> and <laughs> Then Christian Slater and Karen turn themselves into the cops, which is the second in Broken Arrow. He, he also turns himself into the cops with the girl at some point. But and then they talk about what happened to her. She asks about her church windows and stuff, and he kind of sarcastically um, acts like she's not going to like the news of what happened to them. Yeah, he kind of gives her a bit of a smart-ass answer. And very much in the same way that Speed and Broken Arrow had the two strangers thrown together in the uh, become lovers in the he grand did. tradition of Keanu yes. Reeves and Sandra. Bullock and Samantha, Samantha Mathis and Christian Slater. These two get together there. Now it really brings us to mm -hmm. rain, rain on our face. Looks like it's been raining for days. Puddle of mud. I did. Oh, Puddle of Mud did that. Christian rock group, right? Puddle of Mud um, song with their song about Flood. I read that right after this movie, like Christian Slater went to the premiere of this movie in that in that cold January of 98 and then immediately just checked himself into rehab for like three months. <laughs> nice. Nice. He had to dry. He had to dry out. Oh from, wow! Because it was too much hard rain. Too much flood. Too much flood. They cut off the song, the puddle of mud song, like after the first the chorus and go to orchestral music. But I like to think they could afford the whole song. But Slater used all of his co-producer clout to get them to turn it off. That song is terrible. <laughs> I 
will give you one verse and one chorus and no more. That is it. That's right. And that I'm, brings us to I'm, the I'm, end I'm, of the amazing hard rain. And spoilers. I remember, I, I remember much like you said, I remember seeing the poster for it like in a dollar theater in South Oklahoma City. The flood, the flood poster. And I'm, as I recall, you know, the teaser posters were always, I've always liked teaser posters. As you can see, I think both these behind me are teaser posters. Which ones are Magnolia. these? Are you, Magnolia, yes. yes. Magnolia, with the frogs. And then, and, then the, and, then tree, and then Tree of Life. Mm. But it's just the one with the footprint. So ah. Let me close the blinds so you can see a little bit better. Oh, I thought the ha hanging lights in the high school were pretty crazy. That was one fanciful thing that a high school wouldn't have were those crazy China ball lights that were hanging throughout. Those were yes. a little too fanciful. But other than that, I was yeah. like, that was really the only thing that was not right about that high school. I remember uh, not enjoying the movie when I saw it on VHS hmm. and then not really enjoying it. 20 some years later. Well, let's go into that brings us to the next segment of the show, which is the Slater Raider. Oh, oh, we we rate on a scale of one to 10, our feelings in four categories of the film. Although one, and the first category is on a scale of one to 10. How do you rate this picture? The, whole, the, the movie as a whole? Yes. I'm gonna go with about a one. Wow. I'll, 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 no, I'll give it a two. I'll okay. Because I, uh, I always enjoy watching Morgan Freeman, even if he is just cashing a check and, uh, and chewing scenery. So yeah, I'll go two. I'll go two on the Slater Raider. Man, I'm gonna go way higher. I really don't hate this movie as much as other people. For some reason, it's my wow. kind of movie. I like westerns and I like action, and this is the kind of movie I kind of wish they made more. I wish this one was better, but it's, I don't know. I really like when they're in that high school a lot. And I think that it's gotta be either a five or a six for me. I'm gonna go with a six. Mild thumbs oh. up, six out of 10. Oh. Yeah, I, I would rather yeah. see this than a lot of movies, actually. <laughs> this is just, this is kind of, it's got all these, it doesn't do enough with the tropes and things you're right but it's got enough that yeah. I don't know it was some good old fashioned movie fun in the right spirit or something of movie fun it, it, it wasn't trying to like, steal like my 90s. money sure sure you know, but you know, but I think you're right. There is something to be said for you know the movie making, uh, making a movie like this before CG was the norm. Like, yeah, and there's definitely like, some in here for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that, like like it paid away some of the sky. In a lot yes. Of it. It oh was, yeah. Like, uh, Matt paint some of the other town like in those higher exteriors. But you know, Matt paint the town, or mm -hmm. even maybe it was CG. Shit, I don't know. But but it, it, but it never really distracted you from it. Oh, and uh, I would like to say that six out of ten. I'm gonna go with a six. Is way above board for a disaster movie usually this this is the only kind of disaster movie I really want to see like usually a disaster movie is all about people just trying to run from a disaster I hate them sure. so much I think it's the worst genre of movie they make but this was like a western noir movie set against the backdrop of a disaster and I liked that I gotcha I gotcha yeah yeah, I could see that for sure. I thought that was 100%. more fun than the normal yeah. disaster movie like Armageddon or Twister from that era. I never even watched the 70s ones because I hate the ones from when we grew up so much. Yeah. And just trying to outrun a tornado. Yes. The whole time. I never watched Volcano or Dante's Peak. Oh, man. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because in the mid 90s, there was a. Like there was a resurgence in the um, yeah they were disaster. huge they were huge yeah Independence Day Independence Day was a sci-fi built as a disaster movie absolutely right right so That's a good point interesting next category scale of one to ten how do you rate Christian Slater's performance I go five I go five okay he's not average Slater in this one just because I think he looked a little busy having to co-produce the film. Uh, um, but uh, I thought that he did. I thought he did very middle of the road, post peak Slater, if you will. Yeah, unfortunately, is post peak Slater for, ha and it was recognized as such by even me then. And I think that's why I want, I've always wanted to like the movie more because it's like, ah, uh, I wish Christian Slater was in bigger movies because I think yeah. he's good in the movie. I think that like he's fine. <laughs> there, th somebody yeah. else wouldn't have added more. So I would go. Hmm. In fact, he gets more to do this role. Maybe even that beginning where he's in the car. Maybe that's a producer thing to make this role a little more slatery. Broken Arrow was really not not for him, but he was he was fine in that too. It's just that this isn't really the part I want to see Christian Slater in, but I want to see right. him in any part, and he was good. I'm gonna go ahead and give him an eight, and then I marks. Yeah, I just don't, don't know that he sh his performance should be counted off for the problems of the script. As co-producer, he has to bear some responsibility for choosing the material. <laughs> But I understand why he did it to set himself up as an action star. The movie flops, sure. but uh, whatever. Sure. But yeah, his performance is fine. But the third category is scale of one to ten. How hunky do you find Christian Slater in this movie? You know, Slater is a lot like, I, I think he's a Highlander. Like, I don't think he has not ever aged. Like, he looks the same. 
I think he started uh, out universe. looking old. Was his key, key? Was like part of what he was a teen or something? He had the already had the the high forehead. I, I, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with about a six for Ooh. hunkiness for this later. True romance. I think you get a perfect ten hunkiness both from the both from the uh, uh, on the hunk scale and then also on his performance. But this is just a little bit different. It's a little bit different because you got that charisma going in in uh, True Romance. I was gonna go with a low one because I feel like for a guy who's in shape in this movie, maybe his face is pretty bloated. Might have ran <laughs> run into that uh, 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 rehab. But yeah. at the same time, I mean, I didn't even notice this till the third time I watched the movie. But if I'm a lady, I gotta say I got a whole movie movie of Christian Slater in a wet t-shirt contest about the second half of this film. So I'm going to go with a six. There you go. I'm going to go with a six. six. Okay. Personally, I didn't really want to trade looks with Slater in this movie, but at the same time... (laughs) A um, whole movie with wet T-shirts later. How can you? How can you turn that down? And then the last. Bring it all the ladies in. The last category is on a scale of one to ten, and these are negative points that we take off. On a scale of one to ten, how much more would you have liked to have seen Christian Slater in the movie? Why? You know, I feel like he's in the majority of this. Like he's in the majority of the scenes. It's an ensemble movie. He's in it a lot. Yeah. Yeah, like like he's in a lot of this movie. So I think I mean I think I think that he did the 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 proper amount of ratio to so that might be a Slater zero. Time. Okay, okay. So you go go with a zero there. Okay, that's, that's good. That's a good that's score. Fun. That's a perfect yeah. score. I'm gonna say you. I like the, your score on this because this was an ensemble movie in which he's the lead, and we get a good amount of Christian Slater. I wish we, he was doing more Christian Slater things throughout, but we get a good amount, and we the other rest of the cast, the rest of the cast is great. So sure. really. It's then there isn't really a, a cast weak link. Maybe the guy that plays Kenny is not that much fun, but yeah. overall, it's like, I would say, I gotta rate this one low, too, because the other, when they go away to other people, it's always someone you like, more or less. I'm I'm gonna go with only a two. I think that there could be more Christian Slater Slatering it up, more dialogue for him, but at the same time, he was in a lot of the movie and I liked when the movie wasn't with him, too. So I'm only gonna go with negative two. So we take negative two off of, we had a two and a six out of ten or out of 20 so that's 8 out of 20 and then yeah. we've got on the hunkiness we had you had a I had a 6 and you had an 8 I had a 6 as well so we had a 12 out of 20 we're only up to 18 out of 40 and then we've got on performance we have a 5 and an 8 that's a 13 out of 20 so that brings me to uh, 13 plus 12 is 25 plus 10 no 25 plus 8 is 33 <laughs> out of 60 minus two that's an f that's an f <laughs> this movie gets an f and this movie gets an f <laughs> an f for flood that brings us to a close on hard rain are you reading anything right now that's what we always ask so i am so i'm in the middle of about two or three different things i have it i'm listening to an audiobook that rachel maddow wrote uh, just because it talks a lot about the oil business here oh what's that called i'm also blowout 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 yeah yeah, I do. I, I just listen, I'm listening to the audiobook of it. I'm rereading Killers of the Flower Moon. Oh, great book. Uh, David yeah. Grann. Because they're, they're filming it about two hours from me right now. Oh, wow. Um, Pawhuska. Up in Pawhuska, Pawhuska, Oklahoma. And then um, I've always got about four or five different uh, magazine articles I'm reading right now. Boy, what a great book. Yeah, it's fantastic. I'll tell you what, though, man, they're like, they're up there. They started filming the middle of April. And it's a eight month shoot. Wow. Eight mo- yeah, because I was gonna go and work on it. Oh uh, wow. I, you know, I lost my I lost my job, and I was like, well, maybe I should just go up there, and, you know, and, and you know, crew around. And I was like, oh wait, it's seven. They say seven and a half to eight months, which makes which then makes me think that this will be a four hour movie when the whole <laughs> thing is said and done. Because the Irishman was three and a half hours. Yeah, you're right, you're right. And with the being yeah. on TV, I mean, I guess they're going to do this one for Apple. Which will be interesting. Which I got a, Yeah, because... Do you, if I got... I have an Apple computer and you get a year or six months or something free of Apple TV. And boy, yeah. they, they have nothing but selection on there. <laughs> I got it. My girlfriend got an iMac about six months ago. And I was like, oh, let's fire up Apple TV. I was like really excited. And I looked and I was like, oh, there's like five or six things. And none of them seemed interesting. I don't already just I literally just seen Greyhound when I got it so it's like that was like one thing I would have watched and then I That's keep telling funny. myself I'm gonna watch that Sofia Coppola movie with Bill Murray oh, and yeah. I know yeah yeah what um I heard it was watchable and I'm sure it's and I'm, and I'm sure it's sweet I don't know for some reason uh, I just, just can't get myself to do it that's I kind of the same deal like it comes across on hers and I just kind of I pause on it or you know, I hover over it and I'm like 
I just keep going. I'm just not in the just no, not in the mood not in for it. What is the? They also yeah. now have a Mosquito Coast TV show with Justin Thoreau, who it didn't occur to me as I think Thoreau. related to the author of the novel Paul Thoreau. I did not know that. Interesting. Yeah. I'm reading The Grifters by Jim Thompson. Oh, nice. Very nice. I've never. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen them before either. Oh, the, it's a good movie and it's a good book so far too. I think only one of those Jim Thompson books I've picked up so far has not pleased me to the extent that I would like. There. The, he, he writes really fun stuff. Did you enjoy The Killer Inside Me? The movie? Yes. I didn't read, no, I've not read the book, but I enjoyed the Michael Winterbottom movie. Yes. Yeah. How did yeah, you feel about that? Yeah. I've seen the film, and uh, but not, I, have, I have not read the book. So. It's a really good representation of the Jim Thompson stuff where like, it's like so much craziness and most of it fits together and like maybe at 20% you're like, wait, did he just throw this together to pay for booze bills? I don't know exactly what Jim Thompson's life is like, but, <laughs> but it's like it does... He, he wrote a lot of books and you feel sometimes like you're like okay I feel like he had 90% of the idea with this one it was just like screw it they'll publish it like, and, sure, and that's sure. kind of how that movie Killer Inside Me feels where it's like it doesn't all exactly seem to even add up but it's all crazy <laughs> right right no 100% it's like just it's just genre genre piece after genre scene just coming out like one after the other you're like oh okay alright like, this is how it is brutal film I, I saw them filming that one too cause they, cause they uh, oh like, they filmed that in Oklahoma that's right yeah 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 downtown and a lot of it was up in Guthrie as well. Oh, uh, yes. In fact, yeah. I thought about that. I was in Guthrie, not this past time I was in Oklahoma, but the time before, I, I took a trip out to the uh, Guthrie Land Run Museum. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, went about. I'd just like to point out, the Guthrie Land Run Museum has a library, like, on the side, and someone's kind of rigged that up as its own kind of weird museum that celebrates just with a lot of stuff about the Wizard of Oz, and it puts all, all of these things on the wall about how the Wizard of Oz was a metaphor for the gold standard and the wizard was Willi William Jennings Bryan and all of this what stuff the fuck? and my buddy and I we got all into it was like wow this is really crazy and then I got home and started looking stuff up and turns out people have just been like applying different readings to stuff in Wizard of Oz since it came out and whoever is running the Guthrie library is just really putting a lot of their own feelings and, and, and insight and grafting it on it's uh, nowhere has the EB or from F bomb or whatever that guy's name E bomb Franklin bomb Frank bomb L bomb I think it's Frank bomb yeah. yeah nowhere did he ever say any of this it's all that's hilarious yeah so some uh, someone is really putting one over the people of Guthrie in Oklahoma there so there's this whole subculture of that they apply the 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 they they interpret the yes, Wizard of Oz as something as else having metaphorical things, yeah. And they kind wow. of look look at it as the the guy Baum had been like a newspaper writer and maybe had written something about the gold standard at some point. I forget, but when I really looked into it, there, I was pretty sure that it was all a bunch of clap crap. Sounds like it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, what, once you get into those, not even conspiracy theory, but just those that that, that certain level of fandom where they begin applying it to everyday life and like real historical events. That's when I just sort of just kind of jelly away. Yeah, you know, I think that even maybe the Guthrie, I, this may be me now making things up to, to sound good, but the, I think that maybe even the Guthrie Library says that the flying monkeys or something are a hateful racial stereotype. Oh, but Lord. looking into it, I don't think they were either. I think like, like, like no one really has like came up with that. It's like, no, they were just flying monkeys. Yeah, they were just flying monkeys. It's that a was children's story. Of what it was. Next time we're going to look at mobsters 